And um, I hope you enjoy this talk. It is the, the 30th anniversary year of the Hubble Space Telescope mission. And uh, we have a lot to celebrate, both from what Hubble has already done and what it will be doing. And I'd like to just personally dedicate this talk tonight to, uh, in honor and memory of my brother, Michael Wiseman. Uh, Oh, Jennifer, I think we lost her. Yeah, she's not logged in. Okay, she dropped. Uh, let's, okay, we'll find here. She logged, she logged out of it. Looks like she hit the wrong button. Um, let me see if I can get her a text here. Uh, very quickly. Let's see. Well, <clears throat> haven't had that happen before. Oh. So while we're waiting, mobile number, maybe text on her mobile number. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm just checking for. I know. I. I, I know. I gave her mine. Um, She's yeah. back. I don't know. She is signed in. Hi, Jennifer. There we go. Okay. As far as hearing that you were dedicating tonight uh, to tonight's presentation to your brother. That's right. So my brother, Michael, passed away a few months ago. Um, he's always a great enthusiast about science, lived in Northern Virginia. So his family's gathered there this evening, in fact. And uh, I just thank my brother, Mike, for his love and inspiring me in science and also astronomy. And we co-owned a telescope together. So, um, so uh, for him, I'm very grateful. Now, let me see if I can get this presentation to work. I'm going to hit a button that says present now. So that looks uh, promising, doesn't it? Um, and I'm going to present a window and I'm going to present my Novak lecture. That sounds promising, doesn't it? Okay, so. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So are you seeing my slides now? It's coming up. Yes, we are. And okay. Jennifer, a uh, number of people have already expressed their condolences to you and your family. Uh, thank you. We're honored to be here and honored to, well, honor your brother as you're doing this. Anyway, again. Thank please. you very much. I really, really appreciate that um, um, all. In fact, if you want to know more, just Google Michael Lynn Wiseman and you'll learn a lot more about this wonderful person. All right, so the Hubble Space Telescope is phenomenal. You already know that, uh, um, doing all kinds of things. So what I want to explore this evening is just a little bit of history, which you may not know about Hubble. And so what we're doing with Hubble now, Hubble is still a very vibrant observatory. And what we are hoping that Hubble will be doing for us still for years to come. So we'll walk through some of this together. Um, as you heard, my name is Jennifer Wiseman. I am the senior project scientist for Hubble at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, right uh, in the DC area in Greenbelt, Maryland. Under normal circumstances, you can visit Goddard. There's a visitor center we have, and it's, it's a, a nice fun place to stop and visit. Um, the Hubble telescope is actually a partnership between NASA and the European Space Agency. And so ESA still maintains involvement in Hubble. It was launched from the space shuttle um, in 1990 in April, and it is about the size of a city bus. Um, it's in low Earth orbit, so it's only about uh, 340 miles above the surface of the Earth, and you can see in the image there the Earth below, and of course that's the reason Hubble is up there, is to get it above the clouds and the atmosphere to get sharper images. It whizzes around the Earth about once every 97 minutes, going about 17,000 miles per hour. So it's, uh, it's got phenomenal pointing capabilities and, and stability to be able to do observations while moving at that pace. 
Um, so we've become spoiled with Hubble images like this one. This is the, the uh, massive star cluster Westerlin 2. Um, and this was released at, for Hubble's 25th anniversary five years ago, but showing off the pan-chromatic capabilities of the newest camera on Hubble, the Wide Field Camera 3, which is capable of viewing uh, in visible light, infrared light, and ultraviolet light. And we can combine that information into one image so you can see the stars, but you can also see deep into some of the surrounding uh, leftover gas where lower mass stars are still forming until you can see some of these pillar-like structures being carved out from the winds and radiation being emitted from the massive stars that have already formed. Just a beautiful example of how dynamic our universe is and how active it is uh, and just sheer beauty. And so uh, these are the treats, um, the eye candy that we have become accustomed to with Hubble. But of course, Hubble has done more than give us pretty pictures. It's, it's really changed our scientific understanding of the universe in a very profound way. It took some years to get a Hubble Space Telescope supported. So um, the real momentum for it started back in the 1960s where Lyman Spitzer led a National Academy study on scientific uses of a large space telescope. And that gave some, uh, some thrust for Congress to go ahead and support NASA in NASA's efforts to put such a telescope together. Nancy Roman was the leader of the astronomy uh, uh, division at NASA at that time at NASA headquarters. And she really was the champion within NASA for getting this large space telescope uh, mission off the ground and getting the first announcement of opportunity for scientific participation in such a platform off the ground. Um, and she's remained, she remained interested and active in astronomy for all of her life. Um, she just recently passed away and NASA has named another future space telescope, the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope after her. So it will now be called the Roman uh, Space Telescope, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Now, decades before that, there were already people talking about uh, what you might do if you had a space, an orbiting space station and telescopes on that space station, um, what you might do if you had an orbiting observatory. And this was all at the same time frame that um, Edwin Hubble and others were postulating and verifying that our universe, our galaxy was not the only galaxy and that in fact the universe is expanding. So there was a lot of interest uh, uh, and momentum even decades before. And here's a Lyman Spitzer writing, he wrote a, a kind of a, a white paper, we might call it an essay called Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory. Um, basically, this idea would be to uh, to uncover things that we might not have imagined before um, with such clarity by getting above Earth's atmosphere. And quite a few people had to do the the uh, the hard work of lobbying Congress and and the executive branch too to support this idea. And see, here's some of the champions uh, from that era, along with Lyman Spitzer, came John Bacall and George Field and many others. There were uh, lots of ideas for what the space telescope might look like. So um, uh, there was a time when the idea was that the astronomer would actually go up to the telescope and do the observations at the telescope in space. Now, I think that would just be way cool. I would love to do that, but, uh, but uh, reality set in quickly that you didn't actually have to send the astronomer up to the space telescope. You could transmit commands up to the telescope and you could transmit data back to the ground. Um, but there were lots of different ideas for, for how you might do these kinds of observations circulating around before the actual concept became finalized. Here's some of the key issues in astronomy that were hot topics when Hubble was being designed and, and launched. These were the kinds of questions astronomers were hoping could be addressed with a large space telescope. Uh, one of the primary questions was um, what exactly is the, the distance of, of scale in the universe? What's its expansion rate? And how does that imply the age of the universe? 
we knew that the universe was expanding, but the uncertainty on that was huge. It was off by, you know, at least a factor of two. And so uh, astronomers wanted to hone in on that expansion rate, which required a, a much a clearer view of standard candles as distance measurements uh, in the galaxy and beyond. Uh, people wanted to know the properties of gas around and between galaxies. Um, wanted to know if there were indeed supermassive black holes lurking in the nuclei of galaxies and were they related to the activity that were off was often seen in the nuclei of galaxies. Uh, what about star populations in our own galaxy and nearby galaxies and also the, the, the structure of regions where stars are still forming? And what was going on in our solar system if we could monitor it clearly over some time? So these were some of the concepts and areas that were, it was hoped that a large space telescope above the atmosphere could help us answer by getting much clearer images than you could get below the Earth's atmosphere. So here's the launch back in 1990 from uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, some of you may recall that uh, the first images from Hubble, uh, you know, long anticipated were actually disappointing. Um, they were a little bit blurry. They weren't quite as spellbinding as had been sold to the public and to Congress. And this was not good news for NASA. Um, First of all, astronomers themselves were very disappointed. I was in graduate school at the time, and I, I remember, you know, we all felt kind of a, a little disappointed uh, at first. Um, and of course, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, unflattering cartoons and late night TV uh, programs talking not so compliment in not such complimentary way about Hubble. And then, of course, there was the congressional unhappiness with all the money that had been spent on Hubble, and maybe it was a waste of, of time. But you all know the story that uh, very quickly, heads were put together to try to figure out if we could repair the problem, which was spherical aberration caused by a slightly misshapen mirror um, within Hubble. And it had already been decided that as part of Hubble's design that there would be subsequent servicing missions to Hubble. That was already in the plan. And so the decision was that the first space shuttle servicing mission returning to Hubble would be uh, focused on trying to repair this problem. And so corrective optics were put on Hubble um, to correct for the spherical aberration. And from then on, newer cameras, all the newer cameras put in Hubble from then on had the corrections built in. And that's true even today. So that first repair mission was in 1993. It was very successful and Hubble has given us uh, uh, just fabulous quality data ever since. And in fact, these multiple missions that we've had over the years, there have been five servicing missions since Hubble launched. Um, these missions have enabled repairs, but also enhancements to the observatory, making it better and mission life extension. So these are these missions are why we're celebrating Hubble's 30th birthday today and, and knowing that Hubble is more powerful now than ever before. Here's what, for example, the Galaxy M100 looked like with the original uh, optics on Hubble on the left, uh, not so good. And then after the first servicing mission, with a newer camera put on with the with the corrections built in the wide field planetary camera too you see a sharper better image these are the hubble servicing missions over the years uh, from the launch in 1990 and you see servicing mission one servicing mission two 3a and 3b which always confuses the counting and the last one we did was servicing mission four which was actually the fifth servicing mission uh, back in uh, uh, about uh, 2009, and that mission was uh, extremely successful, I'm happy to say. Uh, lots of uh, uh, new, refreshed things put on, like gyroscopes, batteries. Um, two of the science instruments that we have really relied on but were in need of repair were, in fact, repaired. They were never designed to be repaired in space, but they were. The Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and the Advanced Camera for Surveys 
And then two new science instruments that were developed were also added, the Wide Field Camera 3 and the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which is an ultraviolet, very sensitive spectrograph. These instruments are all still working. You know, it's been more than 10 years since this last servicing mission. And, and I, I'm, I'm surprised and very happy that all of these instruments are still working very well and being used uh, very well. And we have uh, good batteries and, and uh, gyroscopes. Uh, we have more than enough gyroscopes put on in the servicing mission. We've lost a few since then, but we feel that the ones we have should be good to go for quite a few years to come. Actually, Jennifer, before yes. you move on, there were a couple of things on that slide okay. that pertain to a couple of questions that I, that people have posted in chat. All right. First off, uh, I see you've got a, 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 up there at the tail end a deorbit mission. Um, someone asked a question uh, about uh, the effects of orbital decay and what is the ultimate lifetime of the telescope. And then you, I see up here also the gyros. And someone had a question about the mechanics of the telescope that are used to maintain that incredible pointing accuracy. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll answer the first one first. Uh, we have um, what we call rate sensing units on, on uh, the Hubble spacecraft, and they're associated with, um, with gyroscopes. We need nominally three gyroscopes to point Hubble for the you know three different axes. Uh, we had, after the last servicing mission, we had six put on, so we had some redundancy. We've lost uh, uh, basically the functionality of three of those gyroscopes at this point. Um, but the three that are left, and this is just due to aging, due, due to you know kind of normal use, wear and tear, they don't last forever. The three that are left are a slightly different design than the three that have failed, but the three that are left are, are much more ro robust. And so we actually think that those three that are left have uh, quite a few years left on them. And even if we lose one or even two of them, we know how to operate the observatory in some clever ways with just one uh, gyro. Um, because we have a real clever group of engineers at Goddard Space Flight Center and uh, and at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And so they've already uh, devised what we call a reduced gyro mode of operation. And we can still point Hubble very well, um, hmm. even if we have fewer than three gyros. So so we're in pretty good shape. I mean, not the, the, the gyros have their, their, their days when they're not doing, they're, they're, they're a little flaky, but we know how to work around that. And we're looking, we're watching them very closely. So, so we feel pretty good about the suite of gyros and how we can work with them for a few years to come. Um, the deorbit mission with the question mark there is, is a question mark. I mean, what will happen when the science basically ceases to come from Hubble? We don't have the space shuttle anymore, so we can't do the kinds of sh servicing missions that Hubble was designed for. Hubble was really designed to mate with the shuttle um, and using the shuttle's robotic arm to pull it into the cargo bay for servicing. It was a, it was a fine pairing, but without shuttle, we, we really don't have a way of servicing Hubble right now the way that we um, were, were accustomed to. But, you know, uh, we do think Hubble is in good shape for probably much of this coming decade and, and maybe beyond for good and good science. So that's the good news story. And eventually, um, if we don't do anything, the spacecraft will naturally deorbit. Um, and it depends, of course, on the activity in the upper echelons of Earth's atmosphere. And that is that depends on solar activity. The sun has not been as active as it might have been over the last few years. So Hubble is not losing altitude very quickly at all. So we actually think Hubble won't need to be deorbited for a safety sense uh, uh, until at least the late 2030s. Oh my gosh. Or we might just boost, that doesn't mean it's gonna be working and doing science that long. Right. We're just, just talking about um, when we might need to uh, uh, safely deorbit it because Hubble's mirror probably would not burn up upon reentry. So that's why we wanna make sure that we steer it safely into the ocean or boost it up to a, a higher, what we call a parking orbit. That decision has not been made yet um, exactly what to do. And uh, we don't have any plans to try to service Hubble anymore, even with uh, robotics or anything like that. But that doesn't stop people from thinking about it. So there's a lot of creative thinking still, you know, 
chatter in, in, about using robotics or private industry uh, uh, capabilities to possibly service Hubble uh, even yet again. So there's still some chatter, but right now um, we our plan, our official plan is to simply make Hubble as scientifically productive as possible for as long as it will work as is. And that looks pretty good. Like probably for several more years, we're hoping to get through most of this decade with getting good science from Hubble um, and maybe even beyond. Super. Okay. Thank you. All right, so here's our, our group of happy astronauts in 2009 on their way uh, to the shuttle, and they did a wonderful job uh, of, of servicing Hubble, this collection of pilots, engineers, and scientists. Um, and they did pull out uh, the older camera, the Widefield Planetary Camera 2, which took some of the phenomenal images from Hubble that are just iconic, and put in the new Widefield Camera 3, which is even better. This, they also took out the, um, the COSTAR instrument, which was part of that optical correction that was done during the repair mission of 1993. We don't need it anymore because all the instruments on Hubble have corrections built in. So they brought back the, the, the camera and, that was replaced and the COSTAR instrument, and they are at the National Air and Space Museum now. So, so uh, that's kind of nice. And of course, these servicing missions take hundreds of people on the ground to pull off. So these are just some photos from during that last servicing mission of people in the control rooms at Goddard Space Flight Center and, and, uh, and elsewhere making these things happen. It takes years to plan servicing missions. People have to also build specialized tools. These are engineers at Goddard Space Flight Center who built very special power, specialized power tools that can be used for one specific task, in, in this case, to go to one instrument and remove over a hundred little screws, little bolts on the cover so that the astronauts could get into the electronics and replace an electronics board. This instrument was never designed to be repaired in space or they wouldn't have put 110 screws on the cover of it. But by building these specialized power tools that work, you see that, that uh, the engineer there has a, she has a glove on that's mimicking the kind of pressurized gl glove an astronaut would use. Um, uh, it takes uh, some special finesse to develop exactly the kinds of tools that you need to do these specialized uh, repair tasks, but it was done uh, thanks to the concerted effort of all kinds of experts on the ground. The astronauts return safely, thankfully, and as the result, we're getting even more spectacular data than ever from Hubble. So this is the core of Omega Centauri globular cluster and because of course we're getting high angular resolution being above Earth's atmosphere we can differentiate star from star here and you can see the different colors of stars different brightnesses um, that is really the reason we put a telescope in space and we're getting these uh, gorgeous images of clusters in star forming regions this is one of my favorites uh, NGC 30 603, I think this is. Um, as I've, as I mentioned, Hubble is in good, t good technical condition, and even 30 years into its mission, because of these servicing missions and upgrades, and and the way that we are uh, actually using the telescope in more and more clever ways, it's at the peak of its scientific return. Even now, even 11 years after the last servicing mission, we're getting a lot of new excellent science out of the observatory and it's a full observatory we, we don't just call it a telescope actually we call it an observatory because it has all these different choices of cameras and spectrographs to use for different kinds of science and spectroscopy is a powerful part of hubble's mission i mean people are familiar of course with hubble's beautiful images but it's actually the spectroscopy that gives us a lot of the core scientific information that we need so here's an example of a spectrum of Eta Carina, and you can see um, the different elements uh, produced in this uh, very unstable old uh, binary, or at least binary, star system uh, being expelled there. And this is taken with the STIS spectrograph, which was in fact repaired on the last servicing mission, thankfully, so we can still get data like this. Hubble has panchromatic capabilities. We can see not only visible light, but also ultraviolet and near-infrared light. So here's the famous uh, 
sometimes called the pillars of creation in a grandiose way, but the, the M16 uh, region where uh, these uh, dusty pillars are being carved out from the radiation and winds from massive stars up off the top of this image. This is a newer image taken with the new camera on Hubble, which uh, gets a wider field of view and higher resolution than the classic image of this released in the mid 1990s. But still, we can't quite see into these dusty columns where we think lower mass stars are still forming. It takes them longer to form, but they're likely to form in these dense regions, especially the tips of these columns. The, 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 the columns are there because they're the wake behind these dense clumps that are, and the, the dense clumps are shielding that wake area behind it from the radiation and winds of massive stars. So that's why you get these columns always pointing toward the massive star clusters. If you look at that same region in infrared on the right, you see something different. It's the same field of view, but using the infrared uh, channels on the wide field camera three, you see through a lot of the dusty veil, you see a lot more stars, you see into the columns, you see the hot spots where stars are, form, proto stars are forming and heating up. So having these different kinds of eyes gives you different kinds of information and a much richer view and understanding of what you're studying. So as a general purpose, great observatory, as we call it, Hubble explores the universe and it looks at things both near and far. So it's general purpose. It looks at just about everything. Hubble's used to study the solar system. It's used to study other stars and now even other stars and their planetary systems. We call those exoplanets. We look at galaxies. We look at the, the stuff between stars and between and around galaxies, the interstellar medium and the intergalactic medium. And we look at things that pertain to the universe as a whole, as cosmology. And I'm going to give you just a few examples of each of these types of things that we're doing with Hubble. Here is, uh, I hope you recognize Jupiter, beautiful image from Hubble. Uh, we, go, we now go back and look at these outer planets at least once a year it's, uh, to see how they change. It's called the Outer Planets Atmospheres Legacy Program to watch things and indeed they do change that great red spot the storm on jupiter is over hubble's mission has has gotten smaller and changed in color new storms have have cropped up um, hubble also provides the only ultraviolet light capability of of any telescope right now uh, um, or in the near future because you have to be above the earth's atmosphere to collect ultraviolet light for astronomy and so Hubble does have that capability and that enables us to see things like this. So here's the aurora um, the, uh, uh, on Jupiter that shows up in ultraviolet light. And we can superimpose that on the visible light picture of Jupiter and really see uh, how these things uh, work together. The, the northern lights there are, are, are reflecting the, um, or are responding to the magnetic fields around Jupiter. And right now we have the Juno probe at Jupiter that's measuring things like the magnetic field and the gravitational field. So Hubble is actually intentionally doing complementary science to the Juno probe so that we learn much more about the environment of Jupiter. Hubble can see Jupiter as a whole and see how these things work together while the Juno probe can take uh, closer measurements in situ, and we use that information in a complementary way. Hubble's even showing us surprising things about the moons of some of these planets. So um, here's an image of uh, Europa, ice-covered moon of Jupiter. The image was taken from the Galileo um, probe, but Hubble uh, has been used to, as a surprise actually, detect evidence of water vapor you can see them very faintly, these plumes uh, in silhouette there on the lower left of Europa. Uh, coming and going, it seems that water vapor may be escaping from between cracks in the ice on Europa, and this is helping to inform future probe missions uh, that, that will go to Europa as to what to look for. It's a way of studying the water under the ice without yet having to drill into the ice to learn something about it, so that's exciting. Let's talk about galaxies. Um, I, I love galaxies. This is a beautiful example. Um, 
of a Hubble galaxy NGC 1309. And if you look closely, you can see several background galaxies in this image. Hubble was really one of the first observatories to help us understand that merging is a, is a big part of the history of the formation of galaxies, including our own. Hubble's images of the distant universe showed a lot of examples of galaxies in the process of merging or in post-merger situations. We now understand that galaxies merge and they grow over cosmic history. And merging also creates a lot of turbulence as two galaxies are pulled together by their mutual gravity. The, uh, the turbulence inspired by these, uh, these uh, tidal interactions and gravitational pulls will spark a lot of star formation. So here in this picture of the antennae galaxies, you see all the hot bright spots where star formation has been uh, in, uh, um, invigorated because of all the turbulence from the merging of these two galaxies. Starbursts uh, uh, are often invigorated by this type of merging. And of course, we know there are galaxies outside the Milky Way, but Hubble helped us understand just how many galaxies there are outside the Milky Way. So this is, of course, a famous image of, of the, uh, the deep field, in this case, the ultra deep field from Hubble. It's my favorite Hubble image. Just a, a small area of the sky, kind of like looking through a soda straw, but you can see thousands of galaxies uh, in this image because light was collected for several days. So you were looking deep and, and very sensitive into the universe. There's only a couple of foreground stars from our own galaxy in this image, which you can pick out if you look closely but every other smudge of light here is a galaxy, and I just never get tired of imagining what it would be like if I could jump and visit one of those galaxies, and if, if we could get far enough our way, away, our Milky Way would look like one of these, uh, these spiral smudges there. And of course, they're not all at the same distance. So, uh, so one of the big uh, challenges and, and joys of studying these deep fields is to try to tease out the relative distances of these uh, different galaxies. So here's a kind of a fly through uh, of the deep field. And distances are not easy to calculate. Distance ladders are something that astronomers are still trying to refine. But it was noticed as different galaxies distances were uh, refined in these deep fields that the galaxies that are closer to us in space and time are bigger and more well-formed than the galaxies that are farther away. Of course, we're seeing these galaxies as they were when the light began its trek to us. So some of the galaxies that we were seeing in this field are a few million light years away, but some of them, such as the ones we're about to see here, are a few billion light years away, which means we're seeing them close to the beginning of the universe and they're small and they're not as big. They haven't gone through mergers and we're not seeing as many of them now, but that's not because there aren't as many. It's because many of them are invisible to Hubble because their light gets shifted into the infrared beyond Hubble's infrared uh, capability on its trek to us through expanding space. So if we pull these galaxies out from the deep field and kind of line them up according to their distance, we see how they're not the same. From the right-hand side here are the galaxies that would be the farthest away. And you see they're kind of small and not well-formed, not, not nice shapes. The ones closer to us in space and time have had billions of years to develop these sometimes beautiful spiral structures. They've merged with other galaxies and become bigger and more massive. If you could do spectroscopy, you would see that generations of stars, having massive stars having come and gone in these galaxies have produced through their fusion, heavier elements like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. And so you see a higher percentage of these heavier elements in the galaxies that are more, more like our own than in the early universe when they were more primitive. This to me is really Hubble. Some people ask me what's the most phenomenal discovery of Hubble. And, you know, I can point out some flashy things, but to me, seeing how the universe has changed over time to become hospitable to life on at least one planet in one galaxy, to me, is really Hubble's greatest eye-opening accomplishment. 
So what has Hubble done? Well, a lot. It's made over a million observations since it's launched. It's uh, more than 18,000 peer-reviewed scientific papers have been published based on Hubble data that the number per year continues to grow even now. Um, some of its most uh, laudable achievements is that it verified the existence of black holes in the cores of galaxies. Indeed, uh, we now know that most galaxies seem to have a supermassive black hole in the center. Um, it, it did, in fact, refine the expansion rate of the universe to high accuracy, and this is still being refined. Um, it even helped uh, make the surprise discovery that the universe's expansion is now accelerating uh, due to something we don't quite understand, so we call it dark energy. Um, Hubble's given us glimpses of some of the most distant galaxies in the universe. It was used as kind of the pioneer for measuring chemical compositions of exoplanet atmospheres. And it um, helped us uh, even to discover these zones around stars where planets form, these protoplanetary disks. So let me say a few more about uh, things about that, but in particular about the fact that Hubble is being used not only for the things that were originally thought of when Hubble was launched, but it's now investigating uh, what we might call big questions and discoveries about the universe that were originally unanticipated or not even envisioned uh, when Hubble was being designed. Questions like what is dark energy and what is dark matter? And are there planets or planetary, like planets like Earth or planetary systems like our own? Um, what's going on in our own solar system? Um, Hubble's even detecting radiation from the sources of gravitational waves, which had never been detected when Hubble was first launched. That's a very recent phenomenon. Let me start with the last thing first. So a few years ago, first exciting detection of gravitational waves. This is information traveling across space-time that is not radiation. It's a distortion of space-time that's caused by accelerations of mass. On the left is a simulation of two black holes about to merge but on the right is an actual signal of a distortion of space-time measured by the LIGO observatory um, a few years ago that were just exactly what theorists had been modeling for years and years and years about what kind of signal you might get from the distortion of space-time caused by merging black holes. Very exciting. Now, merging black holes don't generally uh, also emit radiation, electromagnetic radiation that Hubble could see, but later on, a pair of merging neutron stars incited an explosion called a kilonova, and so the neutron star merger also gave a gravitational wave pulse, but also gave an electromagnetic radiation pulse, and Hubble was able to pick that up and even hone in on where it was. So you see this Hubble image of a galaxy, and in the outskirts of that galaxy blown up there, you see the, the radiation from the kilonova that accompanied the uh, merging of two neutron stars that also sent uh, detectable gravitational waves. And you see it fading uh, over the days there from left to right. So Hubble was a key player uh, helping us understand something more about uh, this, uh, this kilonova and what happens when neutron stars merge. By the way, this shouldn't be uncommon because lots of star, lots of star systems are binaries, and as they age, those old stars are going to turn into white dwarfs and sometimes neutron stars, and eventually their orbits decay and they will merge. So this shouldn't be all that uncommon. We're using Hubble to study dark matter. Here's a gravitational lens, a cluster of galaxies. Uh, so much mass in the cluster that it's distorting space-time and it's distorting it in a detectable way. The light from galaxies behind the cluster is coming through this distorted space-time and getting stretched into these arcs and magnified. And so astronomers are actually using nature's magnifying glass here to, to learn things. We are using it to understand where the dark matter is in this cluster because most of the matter is dark matter. We can't see it, and that's what's doing all the distortion of space-time. We don't know where that dark matter is by looking at it, but we can figure out where it is by looking where the distortions are in pictures like this. So there's a lot of modeling going on by looking at these gravitational lens images. 
And then the background galaxies that are being lensed through this, this, this gravitational lensing process are also magnified. Here's a blow up of one of those magnified galaxies. It looks like a snake here, but it's actually just kind of multiple images of one galaxy that are kind of distorted and stretched into this snaky like appearance. But you can see more detail about this galaxy than you could if it weren't magnified. So you can actually learn something about very distant galaxies that you wouldn't otherwise know if they, because they're being magnified in this way. So uh, this lensing is helping us understand very distant galaxies. Here's one shining from, oh, probably 500 million years after the Big Bang, which is very early in the universe, which we think is 13.8 billion years old. So well within the first 0.8 of the 13.8 billion year history of the universe, Hubble is pulling, is, vis is, is uh, seeing these distant galaxies. But in this case, the galaxy is being lensed, it's magnified. So you can actually see some structure there. I mean, it's pretty, pretty crude and pretty ugly, but when we're talking about a, a baby galaxy that's only 500 million years old since the Big Bang, that's a pretty cool accomplishment. It gives us a little glimpse of what the James Webb Space Telescope might be able to do. Um, we're also using ultraviolet light, uh, looking at distant quasars, which are the, the cores of very bright active galaxies in the distant universe. We're taking advantage of that bright quasar light as it's coming back through and around the circumgalactic medium of galaxies like our own and other galaxies and seeing what's absorbed in the ultraviolet light coming from the distant quasar. And by looking at what's absorbed, we can tell what's in that intergalactic medium or circumgalactic medium. And it turns out that an awful lot of the material in galaxies is getting expelled off the plane of the galaxy and then falling back, cycling back into the galaxy. There's a lot of cycling and recycling of material in and out of galaxies and we're using Hubble to study that. In our own galaxy, Hubble is actually analyzing the atmospheres of exoplanets, something not thought of when Hubble was being designed. Hubble was actually the first telescope to be used for what we call transit spectroscopy, where if a planet happens to be orbiting in front of its parent star, the light from that star will travel uh, through the, the, the outer atmosphere of that planet on its way to Hubble, and some of that light will be absorbed by the planet's atmosphere. So then Hubble's spectrograph can see what particular frequencies of light are absorbed, and that tells you something about what's in the atmosphere. So Hubble has picked up things like sodium and, of course, hydrogen and other elements in the atmospheres of other of exoplanets, and, uh, and working in concert with other telescopes, we even get a broader spectrum. We can see molecules, in particular uh, evidence of water vapor uh, Hubble has picked up, in, often in concert with the Spitzer Space Telescope and infrared facility. And we've even found uh, water vapor in a, in a super Earth atmosphere. So uh, Hubble is doing its part in uh, playing a role as we look forward to future telescopes that will be even better than Hubble at studying planets as small as Earth in, in greater numbers and looking at their atmospheres. I think I need to move along quickly here because I'm, I don't know how much patience you have, but let me talk a little bit about cosmology here. So I mentioned one of Hubble's original goals was to uh, measure the expansion rate of the universe to higher and higher precision. Well, that's still being done, uh, um, and that's helping us understand the history of the universe. It's helping us understand dark energy. To do that, you need to understand the distances to galaxies much more precisely. So Hubble is being used to refine our understanding of Cepheid variables. Um, using parallax and then using galaxies where there are both Cepheid variable stars and type 1a supernovae to kind of calibrate one another and then using those type 1a supernovae that we can see in very distant galaxies where we're not able to normally see individual stars but they can be used as standard candles to help us understand the exact distances of those distant galaxies and uh, this whole calibration scale is being refined and refine to help us understand, for one thing, the expansion history of the universe. That um, 
the universe seems to have been expanding slower in the past than it is now, as you might tease out by looking at this chart. That was a big surprise a few years ago, led to a Nobel Prize. Um, what's making it expand faster now than in the past? Well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we call it dark energy. Dark energy seems to be in a tug of war with dark matter. Dark matter is trying to, is basically mass, trying to pull things back together or slow down the expansion. Dark energy is trying to accelerate the expansion of the universe. And right now it seems that dark energy is winning the tug of war. So here's our Nobel laureates who used Hubble and ground-based telescopes to detect this acceleration. But, but what is it? That still needs a lot more study, a lot more understanding. And I know I'm jumping around here, but let me just say something about what we're doing in the solar system that was also not predicted when Hubble was, was uh, first designed. We're now looking at objects that are whizzing through the solar system that came from other star systems. And I'm sure everyone in this club knows about the interstellar objects such as Oumuamua and more recently Comet Borisov that have been detected um, they were not discovered by Hubble, but Hubble's been used to actually find more detail about these objects. Now, the thing on the left there is an artist's conception of what's going on with Oumuamua, but the comet Borisov image on the lower right is, is a Hubble image, and we know something about uh, Borisov's composition that is very heavily, very high in carbon, higher than comets and seems in the solar system, um, which is an interesting story about whatever star system it came from. And we're using Hubble in complement with other observatories uh, still. I mentioned uh, the, some of the work with Jupiter. Well, even more recently, Hubble's observations of Jupiter have been combined with Gemini telescope observations in the thermal infrared deep into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And that's been combined with Jupiter, Juno's uh, observations of radio waves from, coming from lightning and thunderstorms in, on Jupiter's, in Jupiter's atmosphere. So by using these observatories in a complementary way, we get much more information than we could out of using any of them on their own. So Hubble's capabilities complement those of other uh, telescopes, both ground-based and space-based telescopes and probes. And here's just some examples, Hubble on the top, the Keck on the lower left, Alma on the lower right, and many others. I'll say a few words in closing here that um, uh, Hubble's, uh, um, the Hubble Space Telescope mission is continuing with strong scientific ca capability, likely through the 2020s. There's some uncertainty there, but just kind of looking at the health of the various components of Hubble, we're pretty confident Hubble will be giving us good science through the 2020s and maybe beyond. And this is great because its scientific capabilities actually complement the capabilities of future missions like the James Webb Space Telescope which is due to launch in 2021. Let me say a little bit about that. Here's the, the, the James Webb mirror at the Goddard Space Flight Center clean room when it was being uh, put together there. Just a spectacular thing. It's six and a half meters across, had to be made um, uh, in uh, segment, segments so that um, it could be folded up and fit into the fairing of an Ariane 5 rocket for launch. Um, Here's a comparison of the two. Hubble, uh, Hubble's mirror is two and a half meters across almost. James Webb is 6.5 meters across. But the Webb telescope will see deeper into the infrared part of the spectrum, as you can see down there at the bottom, than Hubble can see. Um, but Hubble actually sees, what you don't see here, is into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum um, and that uh, the Webb can't see. So. Um, and some of the visible light that Webb can't see. So these are complementary observatories, um, and uh, we'll be very, very lucky if we get several years of them both operating at the same time. Webb will not be like Hubble. It's not going to be in low Earth orbit. It's going to be a million miles away um, at L2. It will be out there to keep it as cold as possible. The sun shields will always be pointed toward the sun to keep it as cold as possible. So how are we going to get the best remaining science from Hubble? Um, we're working very hard to make sure that we're using Hubble as, as effectively as possible in the coming years that we have. 
And I won't go into detail on in all of this, but we're, we're certainly trying to use Hubble's ultraviolet capabilities because that's unique on Hubble to get as much ultraviolet data as we can, when we can. Um, we're monitoring the solar system. We're coordinating with other observatories. We're trying new modes of peer review to make sure we're choosing the very best proposals. Um, so we're paying close attention to how we're using this asset while we can. And by the way, we have a marvelous archive. So all this data is being very carefully saved in the archive. And half of the papers coming from Hubble now are based on archival data, which is good news. It means that data from Hubble will be giving us new discoveries long beyond when Hubble's taking new data. And we're getting uh, more than one use out of Hubble observations. There's another telescope I mentioned before, the, the WFIRST telescope, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope that's also being developed for launch later this decade. And you see it's named the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope for a reason. The fields of view up there in this image show you the, the W first field of view as compared to the James Webb Space Telescope field of view and the Hubble's field of view. It's enormous. And so really it's these three observatories that will be complementary to one another if you look at the bottom, you see how Hubble can see ultraviolet light and visible light that the other observatories cannot see. Um, Webb will see farther into the infrared than either of the other two, but W first will get a much bigger field of view, which is better for doing large surveys of galaxies, looking how, how they're distributed, helping us to understand the cosmology and how, how the universe has developed over time how dark matter and dark energy have interplayed over time to give us the distributions of galaxies um, that we have, and also other kinds of science. And as I mentioned, W first is now named after Nancy Roman. So from now on, you'll see it called the Roman Space Telescope. Uh, I'll just close with a few words of inspiration. This is a telescope that astronaut John Grunsfeld brought with him on the space shuttle for the last servicing mission of Hubble. You see Hubble in the background there from the cockpit of the space shuttle. But in front, you see a replica of Galileo's telescope that John Grunsfeld, the astronaut, brought with him up on the shuttle. And uh, it's insp inspiring to see how the technology started from a curious use of a telescope 400 years ago has developed into the kind of sophistication that we have with the Hubble Space Telescope um, behind there. And Hubble does inspire. Uh, here's our beautiful Omega Centauri mission. Hubble images are loved around the world. You see them on magazine covers and uh, stamps, music covers. Um, people know the name of Hubble because I think we've done a very good job of making Hubble images available to people easily. In museums, you see Hubble, you see Hubble images on clothing. Uh, here's a stained glass window from a church near Johnson Space Center. All the stained glass windows in that church sanctuary are based on Hubble images. So people look up and are inspired uh, by the heavens um, as they look up and contemplate the heavens and the beauty of the universe. Um, we take some of our images and put tactile coatings on them so visually impaired persons can, with their with their fingers feel the differences between the nebulae and stars, galaxies and planets. And uh, this student from the Maryland School for the Blind is very much inspired by this image the same way others are inspired by looking at them with eyes. We even see Hubble as on U-Haul uh, uh, vans and on tattoos. <laughs> So Hubble continues to inspire. Uh, the universe is really what's inspiring us, and Hubble is enabling us to see it. Um, and I will say that it will complement also the Roman Space Telescope, as I've said before. So let's wish ha Hubble a happy 30th birthday with this nice gravitational lens. And I thank you for your interest. And um, I'll close with this 30th anniversary image of from Hubble looking at the uh, nebulae in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Thank you very much. Here's where you can find much more information, nasa.gov slash Hubble, uh, Hubble site, and we're active on social media at NASA Hubble. And if we have any time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, we have plenty of time. Oh, okay. um, there, <laughs> wow, this was fabulous. Oh, I, or, folks are commenting that it's been an inspiring and amazing presentation. 
folks are wishing Hubble a happy birthday. It's yes. excellent. Uh, Jay Birch, I'm going to ask you to open your mic. You had a couple of questions that you wanted to ask. So please take the floor and ask your questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, one of them had to do with the physical characteristics of the Hubble telescope. Uh, I can imagine that there are torsions in, imposed by the gyroscopes when they're changing direction of the aim of the telescope. And there might even be <clears throat> microtectites or other impacts that could also, in effect, pluck or strum the structure. Uh, does that seem to cause a problem or do the, the scientists have to compensate for that kind of effect? Yeah, well, I think uh, again, I'm I'm a scientist, not an engineer. So I, but I defer. We have a marvelous team of uh, of engineers and technicians at the at Goddard Space Flight Center and at the Space Telescope Science Institute that are constantly monitoring these things. The biggest, one of the biggest problems for Hubble is that it's whizzing around the Earth, so it's in sunlight and it's out of sunlight, and it's in sunlight and it's out of sunlight. So, you know, these thermal variations uh, had to be uh, accounted for. And yes, Hubble is being hit by micrometeorites. If you are able to, I don't know if it's still on display, but it, to, at the National Air and Space Museum to look at the Widefield Planetary Camera 2 that was brought back uh, on the last servicing mission to Hubble and put in the museum, well, part of that camera faces the outer part of the telescope bus, and it's just covered with these little pock marks from micrometeorites. But um, you know, we've we've uh, learned to deal with all of that, and and particularly what directions we point the telescope, and and how we accommodate for uh, thermal um, uh, relaxations, things of that nature. So uh, it's a very dynamic observatory. I think you might learn a lot more than from listening to me, the the hapless scientist, babble about this. But if you go to nasa.gov/hubble or um, hubblesite.org, you can dig into the technical details of the observatory and what has to be done to keep it um, pointing when it's in in the, the environment that it's in. But that's a very, very good question. Jennifer, one of our other folks uh, mentioned or says that the uh, camera is still on display at the National Air Space Museum. Excellent. Yes, and uh, another comment that came by here from, from uh, Susan, you know, thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate all the work you had to do become so to become so distinguished as well. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. I'm not sure I'm distinguished, but I appreciate the comment. <laughs> <laughs> do others have questions? We still have a couple of minutes. We could uh, post some out. Please, if you have a question, open your microphone and ask away. Uh, what's a killer nova? A kilonova is an explosion that's inspired by, uh, well, in this case, by uh, two neutron stars. But it's just kind of what it sounds like. It's not quite as as uh, powerful as some of the most energetic explosions and phenomena in the universe, and yet it's a little more powerful than just a stellar flare. So, um, so it's an intermediate type of explosion. But I tell you, what's really cool about looking at a kilonova that's that's uh, fueled by neutron stars is that you get a lot of amazing uh, chemistry and a lot of expulsions of things outward that we never knew where they came from before and, and including especially things like gold um, so uh, so the, the the kilonovas are something that we will be studying for hopefully lots of times in the future if we can glimpse a few more of them because they seem to be uh, furnaces that produce and distribute a lot of interesting heavier elements uh, that enrich the universe that we didn't quite understand where they came from before. Um, Jennifer, uh, John Halsam asks, uh, are the camera sensors CCD? And is the cosmic radiation damaging them? Will that affect the the limit? Or? Yes. Um, it, 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 yes. So um, we are affected by cosmic rays. Uh, the images themselves are affected, and we can compensate for them to some extent. But um, we're also losing sensitivities over time in some of the instruments, in particular the cosmic origin spectrograph, which is an ultraviolet instrument, um, it is losing 
uh, sensitivity. Not unexpected, but things like this do happen over time. And so we deal with it. We, uh, if they're like individual, uh, you know, cosmic ray hits and things that we can simply compensate for in, in the detector, in the image, or if there's a bad pixel or a bad place on a detector, we can simply not use that particular part of the detector. Um, if the whole detector is losing sensitivity, then we just have to uh, realize that we may have to use longer integration times or use other strategies to do the science that we need to do. But yes, everything degrades um, in different ways. And that's something that our team keeps uh, watching very carefully, uh, always with an eye to, um, you know, how do we keep doing the science that we need to do while we can do it and what kind of science is the highest priority we, we want to make sure we can get done while we still have the detectors in good enough shape to do it. By the way, I keep showing this image because I didn't get to talk to it too much, but this is the 30th anniversary uh, picture from a region that's very active in the, in the, uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, the, the astronomers at the Space Telescope Science Institute called it the cosmic reef because if you look carefully, you see kind of looks like an underwater uh, sea uh, mm -hmm. coral reef. But uh, really what's happening is in the, in the red part of the image is a very active star forming region. Um, and it is carving out but, uh, uh, these structures, the winds uh, from these uh, massive stars and the different colors are, are being um, are representing what different filters from Hubble show us. The blue light in particular is coming from oxygen. The red light is largely coming from nitrogen. But the lower left is actually just the uh, 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 the ejected atmosphere from one star, a Wolf Rayet star that's very bright, like 200,000 times brighter than the sun that's in the center there. And it's had some kind of repeated hiccups of, of releasing part of its outer atmosphere. And so you see this kind of shell. It's actually several events creating that kind of shell around one star. Uh, yeah. Just Would magnificent. Like yes. Screen? Yeah. That... Am I not sharing my screen? No, no, it, 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 it dropped. Well, all right. So I'm here. I'm talking to you all about this marvelous thing yeah, that you can't even head. see. And um, uh, let's see, present now a window. Uh, here we go. There. Okay. Uh, all right. So this there. is what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the cosmic reef, the upper part is this very active star forming region with this beautiful ripples created by winds from the stars forming in the middle. The lower left is one star, a wolf Rye star that has expelled its outer atmosphere in repeated little little uh, bursts. And uh, that one star is about 200,000 times brighter than the sun. So a very active region and a nice little sample of what you can, can see um, with a good observatory there. Wow. And so it sounds like it really exercises the, all the capabilities of the observatory. That's right. To be able to generate that image. Yeah. Yes. So um, one other comment rolled by here. Uh, awesome presentation, Dr. Ann Jennifer. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told you I had some family watching. Very Excellent. good. Good to have the fan club. Yes. Yeah. So, Hello. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> oh, wow. OK, that's really cool. Thank you all for coming. It's lovely. Happy to have you join us. Uh, that's the, that's the family of Michael Wiseman, my brother. So, uh, so they're all gathered together there. So, uh, so that's me. Thank you all for joining. Yeah. And I think we have time for one more question if somebody has one. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure, please, Thomas. Go ahead. Um, so I've always been fascinated by the idea of uh, quark stars. Um, and I, I was, I was just curious to ask if, you know, Hubble had, had done any astronomy or, uh, you know, to, to try and uh, understand or establish the hypothetical existence of quark stars. Wow. What a good question that I don't know the answer to. So maybe we should have ended this presentation about two minutes earlier. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't know that the answer to that specific question, but we are able, let me just answer more generally, Hubble is really good with spectroscopy. So we can actually tease out individual stars, look at their spectra in, in high detail, and be able to tease out unusual stars with unusual compositions or unusual engines inside. Um, so these kinds of things are done with Hubble. I actually believe the concept of quark stars has been observed or has been studied using some complement of Hubble data, but I can't speak intelligently enough to know what was, uh, how Hubble's observations fed into these kinds of theories. So I would need to do my homework on that. But Hubble is used to study all kinds of stars, including kind of um, what we might call convective stars, which are the lower mass uh, beasts, and, and then also the very, very massive or aging stars that are maybe even fusing uh, helium in their cores and things of that nature, as well as white dwarfs, and as planetary systems around these objects as well. So uh, there's lots of kinds of things that Hubble is doing to help us understand the bizarre diversity of stars, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. We'll continue to do that as well in the coming years. Well, Jennifer, thank you so very much for this. This was amazing. And folks, again, folks are scrolling by saying, thank you, Dr. Weissman. This, it was absolutely inspiring. Um, and thank you enough. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm glad you're interested in this. And again, um, you all are the true astronomers. You know, I'm always kind of embarrassed when people call me an astronomer because I sit behind a computer um, and look at astronomy images, but you all actually stand behind telescopes and collect data from the sky that's just spectacular. And some of the things we're observing with Hubble, we wouldn't even know about had they not been discovered by people using their own telescopes. I think about uh, Comet Borisov and things like that. So, so um, these different types of observatories, whether the major professional space telescopes or telescopes on the ground, or um, the quote unquote amateur telescopes, which as you all know, are no longer amateur, um, all work together to help us understand things um, that we never, never would have dreamed before. So I, I really champion now the complementary nature of all these types of observatories and platforms. They all have a unique niche and uh, serve to, um, to again complement one another but help us to understand things that we would never understand with any one of these instruments on their own so i thank you for what you all do and how you also hopefully are inspiring younger generations of curious people to look up at the sky um, with wonder and awe so thank you for what you do and i'd like to invite everybody to unmute and join me in a round of applause for Dr. Weissman. Thank you. And now for your next session, you need to have a you need to have a session to talk about these new commercial satellites that are about to uh, to come and and blind all astronomy because they're so bright. But that's a sobering topic. We get we get score about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, well, everyone, thank you. Uh, remember that we have a special presentation coming up in two weeks.